I took a streetcar anxiously one day, a Sunday, in order to hunt for the region in the city which should strike me as the best fitted for my attempt at nursing among the poor. The simplicity of this statement belies the enormity of the event taking place. Rose Hawthorne, daughter of America's laureate novelist Nathaniel Hawthorne, and a member of New York's literary elite, was giving up her privileged life to become humble servant to the poorest of the poor. The East Side proved much the most crowded and desperate. In fact, the Lower East Side was synonymous with poverty, crime, and disease. The poor lived in dark, airless tenements, whole families in one room, others with only makeshift beds that they rented for the night. But the cancerous poor fared even worse. Because cancer was thought to be contagious, they were feared and shunned by family and friends and left to die alone and uncared for in dank cellars and alleyways. In an act of faith and extraordinary commitment, Rose Hawthorne at age 45 resolved to dedicate her life to their cause. She moved into a flat on Scammell Street and there began her work of nursing and sheltering incurable cancer patients. Given the remarkable family of artists, intellectuals, and social activists that Rose came from, it is not surprising she would have made a significant contribution to society. She credited her choice of work to her father's influence. Nathaniel Hawthorne's compassion, his respect for all misery, and his practical pity were her standards. In choosing this new life, Rose was living out one of Hawthorne's constant themes, redemption through love and self-sacrifice. Other circumstances also influenced her decision. After a fairy tale childhood, Rose's life was marked by sorrow, beginning with the death of her father when she was 13. Within 11 years of his death, she would lose her mother, Sophia, and her only sister, Una. At 20, over the objections of her family, Rose married George Lathrop. Although there were difficulties in the marriage, with George's early literary success and the birth of their son, Francie, her life was relatively stable and happy. Until tragedy struck again, Francie died at four from diphtheria. Life after Francie was filled with long spaces of loneliness exacerbated by the difficulties inherent in a marriage of two strong personalities. The couple separated several times only to later reunite. Together again, in 1891, George and Rose converted to Catholicism. The conversion seemed to give Rose's life new direction. Emerging from the shadow of her famous father and successful husband, she showed herself to be a vigorous and inspirational woman, an intellectual whose ideas on social justice were far ahead of her time. In 1895, despite the love she and George shared and their sincere efforts to make the marriage work, the couple agreed to a formal separation. On her own at age 45, Rose's fervent desire was somehow to help others. A fire was lighted in her heart on hearing the case of a young seamstress of refinement. Obliged by cancer to give up work, she was operated on at the hospital. Six months later, when found to be incurable, she was given one day's notice before being sent to Blackwell's Island. Her despair was complete. June 1896. Rose took a three-month course on cancer nursing at Memorial Hospital on West 106th Street. Her first day there, she met Mrs. Mary Watson. Advanced cancer had eaten away the center of Mrs. Watson's face. Rose had to observe as the bandages were removed and the lesions dressed. She survived the ordeal and never again flinched at the ravages of cancer. September 15, 1896. Rose moved into the Scammell Street flat and began treating outpatients and visiting the homes of those too sick to come to her. All the care she gave was free. Early October, Rose received a letter from Mrs. Watson. The hospital had discharged her as incurable, destitute and in a state of neglect, she asked, may I come to live with you? Rose was elated. My life of usefulness had begun in earnest. As news of the charity spread, the small hospital filled with cancer sufferers. Rose supported her little group with pleas to the public. Alice Huber, who had been seeking a perfect charity to which to devote her life, joined Rose. She was the first of many who would take up the work. In April, George Lathrop died. His widow wrote to a friend, I was crushed by George's death. My heart was filled with love and misery. 
Benefactors began a search for a more suitable home for the servants of relief, as the women were known. A building on Cherry Street was purchased, and on May 1, 1899, Rose and Alice moved into St. Rose's Free Home for Incurable Cancer. Rose had always viewed the work as religious in nature. She and Alice, with the help of Father Clement Dente, applied for and received permission to wear the Dominican habit and form a community. On December 8, 1900, they professed vows. Rose took the religious name Sister Alfonsa, and Alice became Sister Rose. St. Rose's was too small to have a men's ward, but Sister Alfonsa hoped someday to have a larger facility to accommodate both men and women. She rented space across the street and opened a men's annex. She then besieged heaven for a new hospital. Her prayers were answered when she was offered a 60-room hotel in the country. The Servants of Relief purchased Rosary Hill Home in Hawthorne, New York. It opened on June 1, 1901. As more women joined the community, the work continued to grow, and in 1912, St. Rose's moved to a larger location on Jackson Street, where Mother Alfonso's heirs are still serving those suffering from incurable cancer. Mother Alfonso died in her sleep on July 9, 1926. For 30 years, she had served with great compassion the sick poor. The religious community she founded, the Dominican Sisters of Hawthorne, still carries on her states where even today, all care is provided free. People like Rose Hawthorne, who accomplished great deeds, have always earned our admiration and respect and our gratitude because we know that as human beings, we all share in their individual acts of greatness.